Over to you. Yeah, well, I've wanted to talk to a theoretical physicist for about 30 years, and so I'm pretty happy that you're the theoretical physicist that I get to talk to. I'm probably not representative, so you... <laughs> well, that might be even better. So I want to jump right into it. Um, <clears throat> a colleague and friend of mine is a AI engineer and a computer engineer, and he's built a lot of the world's great chips, an iPhone chip, and mm -hmm. first 64-bit chip, the Alpha, back in 1985. And we were having a conversation. I said I was coming to meet you and that you, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, believe me, but that you believe that consciousness is in some fundamental sense non-computational. And I asked him what he thought about that. And part of the reason I asked him is because he's, of all the people I've ever met, and maybe of all the people in the world, he's the person who's done most to build arguably brain-like algorithmic systems. And so I asked him if he thought that there was a distinction between the algorithmic computation of cognition per se and whatever consciousness might be. And he thought it was algorithmic all the way down. And I understand that you don't believe that. I also went with him a couple of times to a consciousness conference in Tucson where Hameroff oh, yeah. spoke. Sure. So we, we got familiar with that line of reasoning. And I also understand, I believe, that part of the reason that you think that consciousness is necessarily non-computational is because of Goodell's theorem. And so maybe we could we could enter there. So what it I, I'm very curious about your proposition that consciousness per se is non-computational and I'm curious about why you came to that conclusion and if you think that's a warranted conclusion what what you think about that in relationship to these complex AI systems and and also in relationship to Goodell's theorem well I've never seen the argument refuted I've just talked to people who've, ne who've never really understood it as far as I know no the argument goes back to when I was a graduate student and I was doing pure mathematics, algebraic geometry, and I went to three courses, which were nothing to do with what I was supposed to be doing. One of them was a wonderful course by Herman Bondi on general relativity, which had a big influence on what I did later on. One was a talk by the great physicist Paul Dirac, and that taught me about quantum mechanics. And the third one was a course by a logician called Steen, and he taught me about Turing machines, the notion of computability, what it is and how you understand that, and the Gödel theorem. And I had heard vaguely about the Gödel theorem previously and had been rather worried because it seemed to show that there were things in mathematics that you couldn't prove. What I learned was that it's not like that at all. Well, it is like that in a sense. If you lay down the rules of what you call a proof, and if those rules are such that they could be checked by a computer checked whether they've been correctly applied by a computer, so computation rules in that sense, then you can, you can construct a sentence, this is what Gödel did, which the, by the way it's constructed, you can see that if you trust the rules, let us say if you believe that the rules do, if they say yes, you've proved it, tick, then you believe it's correct. As I say, if you have trust in the rules, that trust extends beyond the rules. In other words, you can see that a certain statement is true by virtue of your belief that the rules only give you truths. Yet, that statement is underivable, unprovable using the rules. That, that statement of faith about the rules. It's not a statement of faith. I'm sorry, I didn't understand oh, well, that. I I, I, the, the faith is, it's not a faith. You understand the rules, you check them, you say, yes, that's okay. If that rule is correctly applied, I agree, it does, you know, it's a, lot, it's a, it, it, it's a, a rule which is within something that you believe to be appropriate. Yeah. And, and these rules, it's built up out of things like this, which you, nobody would dispute. You say, okay, if you follow those rules, and it says, yes, that's a proof, then you believe it, that the thing that it says, yes, it's a proof, is actually a true statement. So does a proof really mean that it's true? If you believe that, that, that conviction that the proofs actually do what they're supposed to do, 
gives you something beyond the, the rules themselves. Okay, that, that's, sorry, that's what I was referring to with, this, yes. with the word faith, is that the statement it's not, it's of belief. Not, no, well, I shouldn't is, maybe is, I use that wrong, word. Wrong word. Yes. Well, I, I guess I'm okay, wondering yes. what what do you think it is that cons, that com, constitutes that belief? And, uh, okay, and, and why the word understanding specifically? Because that's the thing, in some sense, that's outside the system. The understanding. Yes, it is, because you can see it is because it's the understanding that the rules give you only truths that enables you to understand that this girdle statement is actually true. And so the, is that belief in that truth of that proof, that is one of the things that Girdle pointed out would be necessarily outside any system that's both, what is it, formal, logical, and coherent? It shows, it shows that the, the I mean, the, I, I read it in this particular way, I don't think he said it quite like this, but I read it in the following way, that understanding whatever that word means is not computational. Okay, okay. It's okay, not, so that, that it, is what it's I... It's not the following of rules. It's something else. Okay.